Healthy has guardrails. Life has been designed that if I step into unhealthy, so healthy is telling the truth and being an honest person. If I step into lying, into unhealthy, guess what? It has natural painful consequences built into it. People won't trust me anymore. That hurts. And so what are those painful consequences designed to do? Motivate you to get back into healthy, to get honest again. Something else happens when we go outside of healthy. We feel an anger if we're, if we're a parent that says you're hurting yourself by going out into unhealthy. You're telling lies. You're cheating. You're stealing. That makes me so angry. And that anger is a good thing because it's saying something unloving is happening here that's going to hurt a lot, of, a lot of people. And the anger gives me the motivation and desire to get everybody healthy again. The problem as a parent is this. I can keep myself healthy. I can't force my kids to be there. You realize when a kid is in survival mode, they're not thinking about what occupation would I like when I grow up. They're just thinking, what am I going to do to stay safe? But they're not saying, you know, I should take up a couple new hobbies. I should maybe try out a couple things. No, they're just trying to survive. And so their creativity isn't allowed to be explored or developed. So they're limited to just surviving. And then, safety is only found in what I'm familiar with, in my known world. So now I have a limitation that I never want to step out of my comfort zone. I never want to step into change or the unknown because I might get hurt. So now what you're basically saying, I'm going to limit myself to never change. you got to heal a lot of shame in order to say, I don't need somebody else to show me positive attention, to feel good about myself. I feel good about myself the way I am. I can be alone. I don't need a relationship. So the first and the main underlying issue, the very core root issue is shame. Codependency is two shame-based people trying to have a relationship and trying to solve their shame. So shame is a core belief that comes out of complex trauma. So when a, a child is neglected or abused or abandoned, they personalize that and they go, I must be neglected because I'm not good enough. It's my fault. And they develop a belief that says, I must not be lovable. I must not be valuable. The only thing that will give me value is not who I am, but what I do. And so if I'm going to get other people to like me, I got to do stuff for them because that will give me value. Then they will appreciate me. So complex trauma, in my mind, the greatest piece of damage that it does is in a person's sense of their identity. So it does in a child who is neglected and abused and abandoned. They think the reason dad is neglecting me or abusing me is because there's something wrong with me. And they draw conclusions about their identity that I must not be good enough. I must not be lovable. Otherwise, dad wouldn't abuse me or neglect me or abandon me. And so complex trauma produces this core identity called shame. And that is what does the greatest amount of damage in my mind when it comes to understanding complex trauma. So the brain begins to develop ways of trying to get rid of that. So narcissism, to understand it correctly, it is the brain doing everything possible to either deny that it has any shame at all or to overcompensate and feel that it doesn't have any shame. So it tries to disprove that there's any shame at all and tries to prove that it has great value, that it is totally lovable and it goes to the place that I'm better than everybody. So narcissism comes out of complex trauma as a response to severe trauma and severe shame. As you live in complex trauma, your world that is presented to you by mom and dad and other authority figures is full of distortions and lies. 
They make you feel that you have no value, that you are not lovable. They make you feel that you're selfish for having needs, and it's your fault that they're unhappy. And you believe that. And so now, instead of seeing life accurately, you have a limitation of seeing life in a distorted way and believing a whole bunch of lies. And then, one of the worst parts of that distortion is your brain is conditioned to jump to the worst case scenario. So something doesn't happen right now, and, and you were expecting it to happen right now, and your brain goes, why did it not happen right now? And you go, wow, and you go to the worst case scenario. And so, another limitation in accurate thinking. In my experience as an addictions counselor, one of the main causes of things that lead people to a relapse is they get into a relationship that becomes a, that is a codependent relationship. And before we know it, they have become back into kind of addicted to a person and all of their addictive behavior and all of their old ways of doing things kick in and before you know it they're all messed up inside and they end up relapsing to the drugs or alcohol. So it is a huge issue that many in recovery have to deal with if they ever want to stay clean and sober. But then I said beyond that, I don't think codependency is properly understood until people understand the complex trauma component. Some relapse. And what I said at the very beginning is this. I've never seen anybody stay clean and sober if they don't deal with shame. Because shame will ultimately, over a period of years, train you that the only way to deal with your shame is to drink or use and numb it out. So if you think of your drinking and using, for many of you, it was a solution to shame. You didn't feel like you belonged, so you drank and you felt like you're part of the group. You felt socially awkward and shy, so you drank to be the life of the party. You were trying to solve your shame with drugs and alcohol, and your brain will still want to go back there today. And that's important to be aware of. So we said that shame technically is a belief. It's not first um, an emotion, but we do have what we call a shame emotion, where I have a feeling of not being good enough. With that, usually comes anger at myself. So shame turns into anger at myself, and then often at the world, and I be just become more irritable. For others, shame causes greater anxiety. So now I'm going around, what do people think of me? Do they think I'm stupid? Is everybody looking at me differently? Am I pretty enough? Am I smart enough? And insecurity after insecurity. And then when you go to be in a social setting, you get anxiety comes up. All because of shame. Because what shame is, is a core belief about yourself. And it's a core belief that is negative. It is a core belief that says, I don't think I'm good enough. I think the reason I was rejected, abandoned, abused, neglected is because I must have something wrong with me that makes me unlovable and I don't have any value. And that core belief begins to morph in all kinds of different directions and affects all your adult relationships, your coping, the messages that go on in your head, and it's all negative. And so for most people, without even realizing it, shame is one of their initial dominoes on the road to a relapse. So the earlier you can catch your pattern and stop the dominoes, the easier it will be to turn it around. If a person with complex trauma is living out of their survival toolkit and you give them all these new tools, they're going to try to be like, they're going to go back to their survival tools. And they're not going to have healthy relationships. And so complex trauma prevents healthy adult relationship. It doesn't make them impossible because you can heal those wounds. You can heal that shame. You can learn healthy tools eventually. Before you can use the healthy tools, you first have to heal the shame and the wounds.
And if you don't deal with your wounds and your deep issues, it doesn't matter how many tools you have, you still won't have healthy relationships. So healthy relationships begins with healing yourself. What I find in dealing with people is there they want to end the relationship but really they're afraid to end it so the reason they don't end it is fear all kinds of fears number one fear of being judged if you get a divorce oh what will all the people think many are afraid of being alone they can't stand being alone but many are afraid that this is another failure in my relationship life. I may never get a relationship that's healthy. And then many people say, I can't break up because I'll hurt their feelings. So their concern is hurting the feelings of the other person. So what I say to them, you would rather hurt yourself? Third one. Many people have an idea that love is always sweet, kind, just be nice to people, all of that stuff. You never get angry. That is very unloving in their mind. I don't know if you've been a parent for very long, but if you're sweet to your kids constantly and you never have to be harsh or say no, then you're not probably a very good parent. Because we all need a tough side to love. If we don't have a tough side, we will just keep pushing the boundary to see what we can get away with. And if you're still sweet and nice to us and cleaning up after us, we will begin using you and abusing you as long as you'll put up with it. So love has to have a tough side and a gentle soft side in order to be a whole package love. So I want to give you five common misconceptions that people have that cause them to stay in relationships when it should have been ended a long time ago. Number one, love means you make sacrifices for people. You have put your needs aside at times in order to meet their needs. That is a wonderful definition of love, but in an intimate relationship or a friendship, both have to be living by that definition. If you're the only one making sacrifices and serving, and the other's not doing any of that, that is not love to continue in that. Because what you're doing is enabling them to stay immature and irresponsible and selfish and you're giving up all your needs and doing all the sacrificing, that will eventually make you sick. So the brain begins to develop ways of trying to get rid of that. So narcissism, to understand it correctly, it is the brain doing everything possible to either deny that it has any shame at all or to overcompensate and feel that it doesn't have any shame so it tries to disprove that there's any shame at all and tries to prove that it has great value that it is totally lovable and it goes to the place that I'm better than everybody so narcissism comes out of complex trauma as a response to severe trauma and severe shame healthy has guardrails Life has been designed that if I step into unhealthy, so healthy is telling the truth and being an honest person. If I step into lying, into unhealthy, guess what? It has natural pain consequences built into it. People won't trust me anymore. That hurts. And so what are those painful consequences designed to do? Motivate you to get back into healthy, to get honest again. Something else happens when we go outside of healthy. We feel an anger if we're, we're a parent that says, you're hurting yourself by going out into unhealthy. You're telling lies, you're cheating, you're stealing. That makes me so angry. And that anger is a good thing because it's saying something unloving is happening here that's going to hurt a lot, of, a lot of people. And the anger gives me the motivation and desire to get everybody healthy again. The problem as a parent is this. 
I can keep myself healthy, I can't force my kids to be there. you got to heal a lot of shame in order to say, I don't need somebody else to show me positive attention, to feel good about myself. I feel good about myself the way I am. I can be alone. I don't need a relationship. There's a part of your brain called the mid frontal cortex right in the center of the front of your brain and its job is what they call flexible response so let's say that tomorrow you have to get four different jobs done what that part of your brain the flexible response center will do is it will play with a whole bunch of different options about how you're going to accomplish those four things okay you know what happens with complex trauma the brain says we don't got time to weigh out options. Pick one and go with it. So if you ever dealt with somebody whose trauma gets triggered, they just go in one direction. You can't reason with them. You can't help them think stuff through because their brain goes to tunnel vision, tunnel response, one response only. And that is the result of complex trauma. Now take a child with shame thinking it's all my fault and then put them in a situation where they're trying to survive and stay safe and what comes out of that is it makes a healthy relationship impossible. So complex trauma takes the possibility of healthy relationships and it makes it impossible because of shame and because of being in survival mode. And so anybody coming out of complex trauma knows how to have a kind of relationship, but it's not a healthy one. And that is where the damage happens. So the greater the abuse, the greater the neglect, the greater the abandonment, the more the child takes home the message and personalizes that I must not matter at all, I must be totally unlovable, I must have zero value, and they develop this belief about themselves that they are not good enough, they're less than. So the greater the trauma, the greater the shame. Now with that in mind, what I want you to understand is that narcissism is a response to severe shame. So when a person is in a place where they feel totally like they're nothing because of severe trauma, they have severe shame, that is no fun to live with. People with complex trauma aren't even aware of how messed up their stress system is. If you've been operating as a little child in an environment that was a 10 out of 10 stress, and that was your normal, for many of you to now operate with stress levels that are just threes and fours, you're probably not even aware of them. They don't even hit your radar. It doesn't even feel like stress. But what I want you to realize, it is stress, and it is activating your stress system in your subconscious. And all of a sudden you're starting to disconnect and dissociate and getting into bad decisions and you haven't even clued in yet that stress is the problem. As you live in complex trauma, your world that is presented to you by mom and dad and other authority figures is full of distortions and lies. They make you feel that you have no value, that you are not lovable. They make you feel that you're selfish for having needs and it's your fault that they're unhappy. And you believe that. And so now, instead of seeing life accurately, you have a limitation of seeing life in a distorted way and believing a whole bunch of lies. And then, one of the worst parts of that distortion is your brain is conditioned to jump to the worst case scenario. So something doesn't happen right now, and, and you were expecting it to happen right now, and your brain goes, why did it not happen right now? And you go, well, and you go to the worst case scenario. And so another limitation in accurate thinking. 
There's a part of your brain called the mid frontal cortex, right in the center of the front of your brain. And its job is what they call flexible response. So let's say that tomorrow you have to get four different jobs done. What that part of your brain, the flexible response center will do is it will play with a whole bunch of different options about how you're going to accomplish those four things. Okay? You know what happens with complex trauma? The brain says we don't got time to weigh out options. Pick one and go with it. So if you ever dealt with somebody whose trauma gets triggered, they just go in one direction. You can't reason with them. You can't help them think stuff through because their brain goes to tunnel vision, tunnel response, one response only. And that is the result of complex trauma. That codependency is not just about little things that you do in your relationship day to day. It's about those things being fed by stuff that's been there for years. Stuff that you didn't even realize was there. So what we have said about codependency is that it's two people who get together and they end up enabling each other to stay unhealthy. And so it ends up becoming an unhealthy relationship. But the reality is it was unhealthy from the get-go because both people came in with underlying issues that cause them to be unhealthy and to relate in an unhealthy way. And so we have to go back and look at the underlying issues that need to change. So complex trauma, in my mind, the greatest piece of damage that it does is in a person's sense of their identity. So it does in a child who is neglected and abused and abandoned, they think the reason dad is neglecting me or abusing me is because there's something wrong with me. And they draw conclusions about their identity that I must not be good enough, I must not be lovable, otherwise dad wouldn't abuse me or neglect me or abandon me. And so. Complex trauma produces this core identity called shame. And that is what does the greatest amount of damage in my mind when it comes to understanding complex trauma. So there you are, the son of the universe. Everything has to revolve around you. The co-narcissist says, let me take care of your emotions. You're sad. Let me make you happy. You're angry. Let me fix your problems. You're in trouble. Let me make all your bad consequences go away. And they give up all their rights. They make all kinds of sacrifices to keep the son of their universe happy. Because they can't be happy unless the son is happy. And that's codependency, okay? But it spreads beyond the couple to the family. So now what you have is a narcissist who abandons and neglects and abuses everybody who doesn't give them what they want. So they are this black hole that just sucks everything but they're never satisfied. So we said that shame technically is a belief. It's not first an emotion, but we do have what we call a shame emotion, where I have a feeling of not being good enough. With that, usually comes anger at myself. So shame turns into anger at myself, and then often at the world, and I be just become more irritable. For others, shame causes greater anxiety. So now I'm going around, what do people think of me? Do they think I'm stupid? Is everybody looking at me differently? Am I pretty enough? Am I smart enough? And insecurity after insecurity. And then when you go to be in a social setting, you get anxiety comes up. All because of shame. And so shame to me is the greatest negative thing that comes out of trauma. And it's least understood. And it's least about. And that's the 
Growing and changing in healthy ways can actually trigger change. And that's important to understand because what's going to happen when you take the steps to begin to heal and grow is you're actually going to trigger shame and that's going to make you want to pull back. And so you've got to push yourself through that to keep on growing. Another one, somebody comes over for a visit and they didn't announce that they were coming and your house is a mess, your sink is overflowing with dishes and that triggers your shame. Or you get a family get together and brother one is a doctor, brother two is an engineer, brother three is a lawyer and what are you, a drug addict? Or you get with your friends and they're talking about all their kids are going to university and getting <clears throat> these really good jobs and they ask you what your kid's doing. Um, they're in detox. Once your shame is triggered, how long can you sit in it before you get into a really dark place? And for many people, it's not very long. Some, if they don't get out of that shame within a day or two, it is lights out. That's how powerful and that's how serious it can be. So remember this, part of why we're doing this is so you become aware that the longer you stay stuck in shame, the darker it takes you in your head. The darker the place you go in your actions. And that is a very dangerous thing. Number four. Many people think love means you never set boundaries. Love says, this is okay, outside of here is not. And if you go outside of here, there will be consequences. So I will not tolerate lying. So to be a loving parent, you say to your child, if we're going to have a healthy relationship, there's going to be no lying. So if you lie, there will be consequences. What happens for a lot of people is that they set boundaries in recovery and people break those boundaries and then they don't enforce the consequences. So it's important to understand it's number one necessary to set boundaries but number two it's just as important to enforce the boundaries. Third one, many people have an idea that love is always Mind, just be nice to people, all of that stuff, you never get angry, that is very unloving in their mind. I don't know if you've been a parent for very long, but if you're sweet to your kids constantly and you never have to be harsh or say no, then you're not probably a very good parent. Because we all need a tough side to love. If we don't have a tough side, we will just keep pushing the boundary to see what we can get away with. And if you're still sweet and nice to us and cleaning up after us, we will begin using you and abusing you as long as you'll put up with it. So love has to have a tough side and a gentle soft side in order to be a whole package of love. 